Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. select or program what you wish to recall? Or does the mind have, as it were, a mind of its own? If it can withhold events you wish to forget, can it make you remember events that never happened? Must all my yesterdays be a plague, said Edgar Allan Poe, forever to haunt me? Would that the past were a dream to be shaken off with the morning? Hey, now, you walk right into me. Why don't you look where you're going? I'm terribly sorry. I wish I could. I... Did I hurt you? No. Knock the breath out of me. Don't tell me you didn't see me. Well, I'm afraid it's true. I'm I'm blind. Oh, my turn to apologize. You, you always walk like this at night. No white stick. Nothing. White stick? I hope I won't always be blind. <laughs> Our mystery drama, End of a Memory, adapted from a story by Frederick Fergus, was dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. He had everything to live for, did Gilbert Vaughn. A sizable income, good education, and many interests. True, his mother and father had died in the epidemic that had taken the lives of many in England, but that happened when he was 14. He was now 25. Yes, for all his money and all his friends, Gilbert was single and he was lonely. It was my fault, of course, that I had no purpose in life. The mistake I made was to feel sorry for myself. I had no idea what troubles could be nor the slightest inkling that my life could suddenly take a turn for the worse. Until that morning when my eyes started to fail. In broad daylight, darkness closed in. Everything went from blurred to dim to quite black. It all happened so quickly, I barely had time to get to my doctor's office. And you had no warning of any kind, Gilbert? I mean, last night, for instance, when you went to bed, no pains in your head, nothing? No, I tell you, no. What's the point of going over the past, Dr. Baker? It's the present I'm concerned with. I think it would be better for you if you adopted a healthy attitude and say to yourself, I'm not the only person who's gone blind. Blind? I'm blind. Why me? What have I done? But if you ask me, it's going to be a great deal easier to cure you of blindness... And self-pity. I didn't ask you. All I want to know is who is the best man to take charge and how soon can he start? Well, now, there is only one man who I would dare send you to. Dr. Julian J. All right, I'll have him then. Will you make the arrangements immediately? I can't stand not being able to see. Well, do you have a friend who could be at your side, at least for the present? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, this Kenyon Grant. He he lives close by. Oh, it might take quite a while. Well, how long? Weeks? Months? Years? Where is this, Dr. J? Well, unfortunately, Gilbert, he'll, he'll not be able to take on your case right now. Dr. J is quite ill. When he's released from hospital, which may be if all goes well in, say, another month, it'll take him at least another four weeks to fully recover. Oh. Two months? What, what am I going to do in the meantime? Today, Gilbert, I'm not going to walk with you. I'm going to walk behind you. <laughs> what for? To see me trip on the pavement and fall down? And what's the matter with you, Ken? Gilbert, listen to me. You don't know when this Dr. J will be well enough to take on your case, and I don't know. 
So wouldn't it be sort of fun to outwit those darned eyes of yours and show them you can get along perfectly well without them? Let's take a walk and I'll show you. All right. 63, 64, 65. Stop. We're exactly back in front of your front door. Turn right. Good. Up four steps. Fine. Now, open the door with your key. You can, you can stand here and catch your breath, Gilbert. You made it. It's simple. Just count the steps from this house to the corner, count back, and there you are. Hmm. I do feel better for it, Ken. Not at the mercy of those darned eyes. The same goes for the inside of your house. Count. Ken, how can I thank you? Thanks are just words. I shall do as you say, with deeds. I've relied on you too much already. That night, I went to bed full of confidence. I could make my way anywhere in town if I put my mind to it. Unaccountably, I awoke during the night. Couldn't get back to sleep. And thought, well, why not? Nobody will be about. I got dressed, went down to the street, turned right, and started counting. I don't know what I could have been thinking of. Did I lose count? But... On my way back. Helen, now, what do you think you're doing? You walked right into me. Why don't you look where you're going? I'm terribly sorry. I wish I could. Did I hurt you? You knocked the breath out of me. Now, don't tell me you couldn't see me. But I didn't, you see. I'm I'm blind. Oh, oh well, that beats all. Oh, my turn to apologize. You go out walking every night. No white stick, nothing. White stick? I'm not planning on always being blind. Where do you live? On Walpole Street. Oh, well, this is Henley. This... How did I get here? Well, I, I think I know your street. It's not far. I'll take you. <laughs> it's funny. I've been counting my steps, too. Here you are now, Walpole Street. Now, which house is yours? I'll take you right there. Oh, I can make it all right from the corner by myself. Sure now. Oh, yes. Is the railing on my left side or my right side? On your right. Now, sure you don't want me to see you to your door? Absolutely not. Uh, you see, I, I mustn't allow myself to become too dependent upon others. I just have to count 62 steps from this corner... And I'll be right in front of my house. Well, as you wish. Uh, good night, young man. Uh, and I, I hope your eyes get better soon. 62 steps later, I turned right, up five steps. Oh, only four. Must have counted wrong. Well, if it's the wrong house, my key won't fit. Ah, home safe at last. I started up the steps to my bedroom when I heard someone crying. I ran my hand along the balustrade. It felt different. The carpet under my feet was different. I was in the wrong house. Who are you? I'm terribly sorry. I thought I was in my own house. Come in here. Well, we seem to have a visitor. What are you doing? I was trying to explain to the other gentleman I'm in the wrong house. If you'll just show me to the door, I'll be on my way. I don't like it, Professor. I don't like it at all. Believe me, gentlemen, neither do I. So if you'll just show me... Fortunate, but we have no choice. We had better dispose of him. What is that? Is that a gun you've got? Don't you recognize a pistol when you see it? That's just it. I can't see it. I'm blind. Oh, oh, oh. blind, is it? <laughs> Honestly, totally blind. That's why I mistook this house. Well, then, let us have a little test. Blind man, walk now forward. Four big steps. March. <gasps> Oh, I 
I fell across something here on the floor. What is that? A body? It's wet. Sticky. Is this blood? Help me. Get up, somebody. I've, I've twisted my ankle. Help me up. What do you think, my friend? Is he lying, or can he really see nothing in this room? I think he's telling the truth. Don't you understand? I can't get up. Is someone going to help me? Don't excite yourself, young fellow. We will take care of you. He did. He took care of me with something heavy and hard, and I blacked out. What seemed like an eternity later, I woke up. I was in my own bed. Standing there watching was Dr. Baker and Kenyon. Well, well, how do you feel, Gilbert? I don't know. Is it my head that's hurting or my foot? Or both? Ken. Hey, why aren't you up in the North Country? Well, I was until I got word from Dr. Baker here you'd had an accident. Let me try to remember. The uh, police found you this morning lying on the docks down by the river. Yes, of course. They must have taken me there. The last thing I remember, tripping over a body, and it was bleeding. They, then they must have knocked me out. That's just what you said before. Said before? When? You've been a little delirious, Gilbert, and you were talking about getting into the wrong house. A woman crying, two men. Yes. One man did most of the talking. There was a body all wet with blood. And I, I tripped over it. I fell on it. Yes, 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 of course, a body. Didn't you find some blood on me? No, not a drop. Uh -huh. How could that be, my hands were on the chest that was bleeding. When you were found, Gilbert, the sleeves of your jacket had been cut away and the entire front of your shirt torn off. You were all grime and mud, but uh, bloodstains? <laughs> no, no. Yes, but that's it. That's the proof, can't you see? Why would anyone do that to my clothes if there wasn't anything to hide? Possibly, possibly, but then again you might have been in, in some kind of a fight. The woman. I wonder what happened to her. All the time I was there, I was sure I heard a woman's voice oh. sobbing. Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, Gilbert, I want you to drink this. It'll make you sleep. You don't know how I wish I'd had the use of my eyes. Then I could have seen everything. The two men, the body. Yes, Gilbert, I, I'd say you don't know how fortunate you were. If all this really happened to you and you had been able to see it, it's quite possible right now that you'd be dead. Dr. Baker's voice, he doesn't appear to quite believe Gilbert's story of the body, the two men, and the woman. What a fragile thing truth can be if it is shaken by doubt. However, it is rare indeed that Mystery Theater brings you a hero who cannot ultimately prove his word. Besides, you and I heard the strange goings on with our own ears. I haven't forgotten I advise this would be an account of the perverseness of memory. It will be. Don't worry. Remembrance of the past has been a theme for writers, poets, and painters alike. Who hasn't seen and been intrigued by Salvador Dali's extraordinary painting of the soft watch, of time bent out of shape, of what Dali calls the persistence of memory? The mystery of the body and the sobbing woman was not solved. Kenyon Grant told me a house-to-house -house police search on Walpole Street turned up nothing. Dr. Julian Jay performed the operation. My eyes were as good as new, and he sent me to a warm climate to recuperate. Kenyon and I decided on Turin, Italy. <laughs> Kenyon, where are we? On the Via di Po. What, again? <laughs> I don't think being able to see gives you any better sense of direction. <laughs> well, then why don't you lead the way? I mean, we'll never get to know Turin if we keep walking around in a circle. It's darn uncanny. 
Always we end up right back at the Church of San Giovanni. Anyway, we've kept to our promise not to go inside picture galleries, monuments, shrines, churches, or any of the other tourist traps. You might just have to break that vow. Never. What if I told you I have just seen the most incredibly beautiful girl go into the Church of San Giovanni? I'd say, what are we waiting for? The girl was quite a beauty. But her most mesmerizing quality was a strange and faraway look in her eyes. Kenyon and I stood silently and stared as she knelt and prayed, and then was joined by an elderly lady. Together they left the church. We followed and stood on the steps watching as they slowly walked across the square. Tell me, senor. Do all English gentlemen stare at young ladies they don't know? Now, wait a minute. Senor, an Englishman travels through your fair land to see and praise all that is beautiful. If we've done wrong, will the senor convey our regrets to the lady? Uh, your wife, sir? Or, should I say, your daughter? She is a leader. Ah, then. A friend. Let me congratulate you, senor, and also congratulate you on your proficiency in our language. I have spent many years in England. Many years? Well, I should not have thought so, since the senor has not picked up a particular trait of the English. And what might that be? Uh, to mind your own business. Englishmen. <laughs> I have never trusted them. What an extraordinary fellow. Very arrogant, wasn't he? Hey, look, Ken, there she is. Walking back now with the old lady. Oh, there goes some crusty old gent over to them. He's tipping his hat. See? By the fountain? Uh, I guess everyone knows everyone else in a small Italian city. Our drama is not over. There goes our friend, Mr. Nosy Parker, to join the group. Oh, so he did know the girl after all. Kenyon, I have got to meet her. I wish you luck. <laughs> How many times I went back to the church of San Giovanni, I never saw that girl again. My heart ached, but she and her elderly companion passed out of my life. Kenyon went back to Scotland, where he and his mother had a shooting lodge, and I returned to London. Then, call it coincidence, I prefer to call it fate. One day I was strolling down Regent Street, and there she was. That girl. She was alone. I followed her to Hobart Gardens to a very respectable-looking boarding house. Determined to meet her, I took rooms in the same house. And every day, sat in the park opposite, watching. One morning, she came out alone. And without thinking, walked across the road, right into the path of a carriage. Look out! Driver, rein in your horses! I was at the girl's side in an instant, scooped her up and carried her back to the park and... Sat her down on the bench. That was close. Yes, it was. Allow me to introduce myself. Gilbert Vaughan. How do you do? Uh, what is your name? Pauline March. I have taken rooms in the same house across the way where you live, Miss March. I was just going to the chemist's to get a prescription for Teresa. Oh, yes, Teresa. Is that your companion? A servant. She's ill. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. Nothing serious, I hope? Well, I think I've lost the paper with the prescription on it. it. It was from our Italian doctor. I could write to the professor for another prescription. I'm afraid you've quite lost me. Who is the professor? Yes, sir, I could do that. I think he may still be in Turin. Uh, is he? Uh, you've not been long in England, Miss March? Some time. Some months. I saw you in the spring, in a church in Turin. Turin? Italy? You saw me. At San Giovanni. You were there with your old servant, Teresa, I suppose. Uh, one morning? Yes. We often went there. Uh, you were English? Your name is not Italian. Yes. I am English. Your home is London? You're not going back to Italy? I don't know. I can't tell. It will depend upon the professor. Oh, yes. Uh, the one in Turin. Teresa said he's arriving here in a few days. Thank you, sir. 
It was pleasant talking to you. I shall walk with you tomorrow in the park. Like that. Out of the blue. The next four days, we spent the afternoons together, walking and talking. Her chaperone was ill. Did Pauline like me? Care for me at all? It was all quite maddening, this girl. So beautiful and yet so exasperatingly vague. Uh, you are the young man who saved my niece's life, yes? Oh, it was nothing. I, I just happened to be there at the right time. Do you wish a reward? Is that why you asked me into your rooms? Well, I never quite thought of it that way, but I do wish a reward of sorts. About Miss March, can you tell me where are her father and mother? They are dead. I am her guardian. Why are you so interested, young man? My name is Gilbert Vaughan, sir. I will be frank with you. I love Pauline March. And I will marry her. She is not to be married. Professor, um, not knowing your name, I feel I, I'm talking to a war. Oh, my regrets. An oversight. I am Manuel Ceneri. Professor Ceneri. I realize there is something strange about Pauline. Perhaps something in her life, something past. Who can tell? But that does not deflect me from the one desire I have, and that is to marry her. I am a gentleman, a fine family, and rich. Mr. Vaughan, I like your directness. I shall be direct with you. You say you are well off. Would you be able to satisfy me with some proof? Happy to. If you'll excuse me, I'll go to my desk and write a few lines to my attorneys, asking them to give you the fullest details. Sign. Shall we meet tomorrow at 10 o'clock? Is the fact that you are here in the park to meet me an encouraging sign, Professor Chenery? And I've been thinking to myself what I had seen you somewhere before, Mr. Vaughan. Yes, you have. I was in Turin last spring, and you may have seen me standing in front of the church of San Giovanni. Ah, yes, quite possibly. Mr. Vaughan, I have many reasons for wishing my niece to remain single. But your proposal has induced me to reconsider. The man who marries Pauline March must take her as she is. He must ask no questions, seek to know nothing of her birth, her family, nothing of her early days. He must be content only with the fact that she is a lady, that she is uh, very beautiful, and that he loves her. Is that enough for you? More than enough. With Pauline, my wife, I should ask for nothing more. Good. You may be pleased to learn my niece is not entirely indifferent to you. Would it be possible for you, my dear Vaughan, to agree to an early marriage? <laughs> Would it be possible? In fact, an immediate marriage. Say, the day after tomorrow. But I don't know if she loves me. Would, would she consent? Pauline is obedient and will do uh, as I wish. It was a mad thing to do. My only excuse was that I was so desperately in love and so convinced that after we were married, I could make her love me. And I didn't insist on some kind of a courtship. Nor did I ask myself why her guardian seemed so anxious to marry her off. It was only after the ceremony, we were in the train on our way to Scotland for our honeymoon, that I was alone with her. Well, here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert Vaughn. Are you pleased, Pauline? Pauline? Do you? I said, are you pleased? Yes. Oh, my darling wife. If I could only make you feel as I do. Yes. Will you say, just once, Gilbert, my husband? Gilbert, my husband. 
I won't pretend to you that marriages are usually arranged this way. Now, this is just as new for me, uh, also. Yes. Darling, when we went walking in the park, you remember? You talked so much more than this. I don't know what to say. I like being with you. Gilbert, my husband. Professor Chinari said it was best for me, so I accept that. He said to me, the man who married you must be content to take you as you are and not try to know anything of your past. I agreed to that. I have no past. Everything is a today. I suppose that's a blessing, darling, that, that way you can't remember ever having been hurt. I was hurt, Gilbert. Yes, I was hurt. But what happened? It's all gone now. Well, I can't tell you how happy it makes me to hear you say my name. Gilbert, it's a nice name. When you say it, my darling. What a strange way for a man and a woman to begin their honeymoon. But since it means you sitting here beside me, I wouldn't change it for the world. This is WBBM in Chicago. It's midnight. A situation, to say the least. A young man married a girl who is, in fact, only half a girl. Her past is shrouded in mystery. Is it at all possible for them to build a lifetime only in the present? Why not, one could argue. Why are our yesterdays so essential to our todays? The answer may be startling when I return with it shortly in Act Three. We begin Act Three with a dilemma wrapped in an enigma. Who is Pauline March, now the young Mrs. Bourne? The honeymoon to Scotland was hardly that. A young man married to someone with memory missing, the power of reasoning absent, the feeling of emotions quite beyond her grasp. Why could she live only from day to day? I had to know. I could no longer remain married in name only to this beautiful creature, not only cut off from the past, but apathetic in the present. Kenyon Grant and his mother were returning to London. I prevailed upon the good Mrs. Grant to take care of my Pauline while I played detective. I returned to Turin, Italy, to the very spot in the square of San Giovanni, where I had first seen Pauline. Welcome again to Torino, Englishman. Signor, yes, I remember. I'm very glad to see you. You have come to Italy to stare at more of our ladies? No, I'm here to find Professor Cineri. And I know you can help me. Where may I find him? Cineri, Cineri. I'm not familiar with that name. But I've seen you in his company. I know no man of that name. Good day, Signor. Wait, wait, please don't go. I beg you to help me, Signor. It's vitally important. There's no use denying you don't know him. Oh, what makes you so positive, Englishman? Because I have seen you walking arm in arm with the professor, talking to him right here by the fountain in this square. Now, I know you know him. Help me, Signor. It's not for myself. It's for his niece, Pauline. What do you have to do with his niece? Everything, Signor. She is my wife. <laughs> A tall, thin Italian seemed thunderstruck. I heard him mutter, Tratidora, traitor. Then he turned back to me, his face composed. I should wait in my room at the Hotel Excelsior, he said. He would send Professor Cineri to me. Professor, please come in. I, I was surprised to learn you are here. How is your wife? Why didn't you make me aware of Pauline's peculiar mental state? Oh, come now. You had seen her a number of times. I'm sure she is no different today than when she first proved so attractive to you. In fact, 
I'm counting on marriage to help her regain, uh, uh, how can I say it, her past? I believe that little by little her memory may be built up again, or it may return as suddenly as it left her. So, Pauline has not always been like this. Some years ago, she received a great shock, a sudden loss. The result, her past was blotted out. Events disappeared. Friends became strangers. She was, as you bet her, born again. What was the shock that did this to her? That is one of the questions I cannot answer. Yes, but I'm her husband. I have a right to know. You have a right to ask. And I have a right to refuse. Can you answer me this question? Who is the gentleman who arranged this meeting? Not that I can tell you. His name is Makari. What does he do? His, his profession? He is a financier. Signor Makari was greatly disturbed to learn that Pauline is my wife. Why so? He knew her years ago and wanted to marry her himself. She refused him. More than that, my dear Vaughan, you would not wish to know. I returned to London. Time passed. Sometimes I thought Pauline was better. Other times, no improvement at all. Dr. Baker came, sent specialists. They all said the same thing. She might recover if she could relive the exact circumstances which caused this block. It seemed hopeless until that morning when I received a visitor. Signor Vaughn? Uh... Signor Macari. Ah, you know my name. As you know mine, the professor has told us. What brings you to London? How is Pauline? Improving, I hope, little by little. You may find it better to have a wife who cannot remember her past. Am I... I see. Uh, you give me an idea. You knew Pauline years ago. Yes, senor, I did. Well, it occurs to me that if she were to see you, senor... It is one of the reasons I am here. Stay where you are. I shall fetch her. Pauline... Will you look at this gentleman closely? Yes. I am. Pauline? Do you remember me? No. Let me take you by the hand. No. Pauline, it is a long time since we last met. But you cannot have forgotten me. Try and think who it is, my darling. None may recall, though. She does not remember. But she spoke in Italian. I have never heard her speak Italian. Signor Macari, I believe she is remembering. Ah, do you think so? Signor, how long will you remain in London? Ooh, several weeks. I have a business here. Would you please pay us another visit? Several visits, as many as you care to. I believe that your presence might be the key to my wife's recovery. <laughs> Signor Macari had not been gone five minutes when Pauline took me by the hand in a fierce grip and pulled me out the door. Her face was fixed, immovable, her eyes wide. Something in her disordered brain was compelling her to go somewhere as quickly as possible. My hand in hers, we ran this way, that way. She seemed uncertain of the street. Finally, we came to a house not unlike mine. Up the steps four of them and then she tried the front door open door it is locked pauline darling i don't have the key it's it's a deserted house open door i must go in yes but it's locked pauline we can't go in there open hurry all i have is the key to our house all right i'll try sometimes who knows I had once before unlocked the door, thinking it was my own. A feeling of horror ran through me. This was no coincidence. I followed Pauline up the dust-laden stairs and into a room. Yes. Yes, it was. 
I could sense immediately it was the very room into which I had come two years before, blind. Pauline ran to a room beyond. I ran after her. We shouldn't have come, Anthony. And why so late at night? I only did as you asked because it was your birthday. But promise me you'll stay here with me until they go. I wish they wouldn't be so angry. Pauline, what are you trying to tell me? I don't trust them, Anthony. Especially him. Please, for my sake, please, Anthony, don't go in there. Oh, don't. Darling, darling, calm yourself. There's no Anthony here. They're in there. Anthony is in there with him. What can I do? Anthony, Anthony, look out. He's got a knife. I had my arms around her, trying to comfort her. Suddenly, I became one with her nightmare. The room beyond, which had been empty and dark, was suddenly filled with light. I saw a young man sit down with his back to me. Facing him was the professor, and next to him, standing, Makari. I saw a knife flash through the air. The young man started to get up, fell back, and then tumbled to the floor. I saw myself... Standing in the doorway, my hands groping, eyes unseeing. Who are you? I'm terribly sorry. I thought I was in my own house. Well, Gilbert, I've given your wife a sedative. I'm glad you called me. What, uh, what happened? Dr. Baker... If I were to tell you what Pauline and I have been through, you wouldn't believe it. Whatever it was, I tell you right now, I've noticed quite a change in her. She seems much more at peace. It just may be that tonight was a turning point. The next morning, Signor Macari appeared. Good day, Mr. Juan. I am back just as you requested. I do so wish to help you. Why did you murder a man two years ago in a house not many steps from here? Are you mad, Mr. Vaughan? On the 20th of August, you stabbed to the heart a young man. The witness to your murder was Professor Chenari. It was you, the blind young man. You. Why did I let him talk me out of finishing you off? You don't even deny it. That man, I want to tell you his name, was Pauline's lover. Hers is a noble family. The only punishment for such betrayal is death. Yes, I say it again, Mr. Vaughan. He was your wife, Pauline Lava. He had no wish to marry her, and so Cherary and I killed him, even in her presence. I don't believe you. Please leave this house immediately. As you wish. But think, Englishman... For what other reason would I willingly admit to you such an act? Willingly or not, you have admitted to murder, a fact in which the police would be very interested. And where would you tell them to look for the body? What proof do you have that all this happened? You forget. I was there. Were you indeed? Did you see all this with your own eyes? Who would believe the word of a witness who was blind? seen in a nightmare vision. Only Pauline. And Dr. Baker absolutely forbade me to question her anymore. I was a man caught up in a never-ending hallucination. Then one day, an unexpected visit. I could no longer stay away, Mr. Vaughan. I may risk my life here, but so be it. How is Pauline? Professor Chenary, at the moment, she's in limbo. She's somewhere between the past and the present. I believe some of her past has returned, but instead she's lost the memory of her marriage to me. What brought this about? A visit from a man you know. Makari. Professor, had Pauline ever a lover who dishonored the family name? Who has told you such lies? Who was the young man murdered by Makari in a house not far from here? What is all this? Who, where did you hear such a story? A story? You were there, Professor. And so was I. It was you. 
And now I recognize you. But uh, could you see? Nothing. But I heard everything. Professor, you are an accessory to a murder. It was... It was... I couldn't stop him. Killing was not my idea. I, I loved that boy. I want the truth. Who was he? He was Pauline's brother. My sister's child. He, he was Anthony March. Anthony and Pauline were the two children of my sister, who was Italian, and her husband, an Englishman. Anthony turned out no good. His mother and father knew it, and before they died, they entrusted into my care their money for the children. Anthony knew this and borrowed against what was coming to him, spent that, and then he borrowed all the funds Pauline was to inherit. He threw that away on gambling, horses, bad friends. Who did he borrow from? Macari. The day Anthony came of age, Macari demanded the thousands of pounds he had loaned the boy. I gave him Anthony's inheritance, and no more. I would not give him Pauline's share. This infuriated Macari to the extent that he killed poor Anthony. I was to be the next victim. But you came in, and even without being able to see, you saved my life. Where is Anthony's body now? I ransomed it with Pauline's money, and it is buried in the family vault behind the church of San Giovanni. Gilbert? Gilbert, where are you? Go ahead, my boy. Take care of her. Tell her her uncle was here and that I sent my love. The pieces of the puzzle had finally all come together, as had my dear wife's memories and mind. I shall always bless the blindness that brought me into her life and strive for the day her eyes are wide open to my love. What happened to Signor Macari? He was caught. But most important, what of Gilbert Vaughan and Pauline? A trick of fate, you might call it. A young man who once was self-centered, selfish, and spoiled, now had to devote himself to healing and courting the girl he was married to. I'll tell you more when I return shortly. In a Shakespeare sonnet, it says... When to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. However, I am glad to report to you that no sighs, nothing past, no question marks will assail these young people embarking on a life together. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Carol Titel, John Lithgow, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed